All right, and welcome to Harmony Within, Exploring and Healing Relationships and the Unconscious or Subconscious Mind. My name is Dawn Bennett with Unified Mind, and today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be working with three main techniques and strategies that you can use when you're struggling in relationships. We're also going to explore where relationships and actually all of our strategies of our mind come from. So that's what we're going to do. So the reason why this is important is many people run the same patterns over and over again, right? We tell ourselves, well, I'm not going to get upset about that. Or, or I don't think this is going to bother me anymore now that I've had a certain level of understanding. Yet for some reason, we find ourselves procrastinating about the same things or getting annoyed about the same things in our partner or in a series of partners, or we find ourselves going in the same patterns of how do we interact? Do we speak our truth? Do we not speak our truth? And all of those are strategies that we've learned over time and usually originate from the unconscious mind. So as we go through today, what you're going to learn is how to shift this for yourself at a deeper level and also how to start exploring some of these things. Now, of course, some of the trauma um, things that are very emotionally intense, you want to explore with a professional, right? Whether that be with me, whether that be with a counselor or a therapist, I always tell people don't work on traumas yourself, even if it doesn't seem like a trauma anymore. And what I mean by that is let's say you fell off your bike when you were a child, you're like five years old, you fall off your bike and you get super scraped up. You're really bloody and nobody's around. And you're screaming and you're trying to find somebody and you're panicky. That can be experienced as a trauma then. And so if it's a trauma, then we still don't work on it. Because even though as an adult, you're like, oh yeah, that was a, that was a bummer time in my life. Sometimes it can unveil deeper things within our unconscious mind that just need a little extra support in order to clear safely. So just be aware of that. And that's not, be af- that's not to say be afraid of any moment where you're upset in childhood. That's not what I'm saying either. But um, when I say trauma like that, what I mean is big T trauma and a big T trauma is defined as something that at the moment seemed life-threatening or really dangerous to yourself or to others. So that's what I mean by, by, tra- by trauma in that manner. And this is Kitty Valentine. He's been missing me. So he's going to be on the video for a while today. All right. So I'm going to pop in and out of PowerPoint presentations, just so we've got some visuals to look at and think about. And now I lost my PowerPoint. Oh, the unconscious mind. So how many of you have actually heard of the unconscious mind? The unconscious mind is the part of us, I like to say, that drives to the store when we get there safely and we don't remember driving to the store. The unconscious mind is also the part of us that drives home when we meant to go to the store and we get home, we're like, oh, I forgot to go to the store, right? That's the unconscious mind. It it runs what we're going to do at all points in times, right? It runs our heart rate. It runs all the things we do without thinking about it. Once we even know something, know how to do something really well, and we do it without thinking about it, that's also unconscious, Right? They call it unconscious competence, where we know something so well, we don't even have to think about it, like driving. Okay. So the job of the unconscious mind really is to keep us safe. And safe is defined as whatever the unconscious mind decides safety is. Now, the unconscious mind learns all of its strategies. In other words, all the ways that it's going to do everything usually between the ages of zero to seven. Those are the core years in which which the unconscious mind is structured. When we're young like that, we are in a different brain pattern. Though our logical mind has not developed yet. So what that means for us is it's almost as if we're in a hypnotic or really deep meditative trance. When they say kids are little sponges, we really are. We are absorbing everything around us. So even things that weren't directly taught to us can absorb into our unconscious mind. And we'll get into that a little bit further. The other job of the unconscious mind, some of the other jobs, is it also stores our memories. It organizes our memories and decides what we're going to remember, what we're not going to remember. It decides 
and represses memories that have unresolved negative emotion. So when people are struggling to remember certain memories from childhood, there can be some negative emotions, not necessarily trauma, just something that the unconscious mind isn't ready or doesn't feel safe to deal with yet. And so that can be hidden in the unconscious mind. Now, along the same vein is when the unconscious mind decides it's time to heal those things, the unconscious mind will present them for, for healing. So that's how people have breakthrough memories of something in the past, whether it be traumatic or not. Okay. The brain does not know the difference between past, present, and future. So this is why we can think about something that happened four years ago and the memory can create physical symptoms and can create strong emotions. Have you had that? Right? Where you think about something in the past and you get really angry and you feel it in your stomach or you start getting anxious feelings or you get sadness. And that's because the brain doesn't know the difference. It thinks it's happening as if now. So when I work with clients and what I remind clients is that whatever you're experiencing now, that's the important part. And if we can focus our minds to now instead of past or future, then we can create a new reality for ourselves. The same thing about the future. Often humans get really stuck in what will happen. What will happen next week when I give my presentation? What will happen if I don't have enough money to pay the mortgage? What will happen if XYZ conversation has? What will I say? And we can actually get so worked up around a potential imaginary conversation before it even happens that we can get angry at a person before we even have a chance to have a conversation. And this is because the mind is perceiving it as if it's already happened. So what's really important about these techniques for you is you get to use them to stay more present, to stay in your body, to create safety and to really choose the life that you want to choose, right? So emotional memories in the unconscious mind can create physical symptoms. And I really want to highlight this because Many of our physical symptoms, many of our disease states can be caused by unresolved emotion. So for example, when I work with clients and they have a lot of physical pathology of whatever kind, especially if the doctors haven't been able to figure out where it's coming from, they can't really find a source, numbers look normal, Usually there's been either a series of emotional events that have created an extreme amount of stress around the body and the body has actually stored those emotions, or there was a really significant event that happened within one to two years before they started experiencing symptoms. So this can look like a divorce. This can look like the death of a parent. This can even look like something that seems positive, like moving out of the house and going to college or getting a new career. But the body perceives stress, positive and negative stress, all is the same. And so if there's some belief that the unconscious mind is holding around that transition in life, it can create physical pathology. So let me give you an example of that. Let's say that you love being at home and you're really close to your whole family and you get encouraged to go off to college. And your brain thinks, your unconscious mind thinks that the only place you're safe is at home with your family. So now you go off to college and everybody's excited and you're even excited. You're getting to learn what you wanna do in your life. You are excited about the path that you've chosen, but someone in your unconscious mind, your unconscious says, mm, this new place isn't safe. Or perhaps it feels like you're being abandoned by your parents, it decides, because your unconscious mind has decided that when you leave the house, that means you are no longer part of. So your unconscious mind can translate even positive transitions in life to something quote unquote negative and can create extreme physical stress, which then can turn into physical pathology. And so there's a book out there called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. 
very dry read. I don't recommend, unless you really love that stuff, I don't necessarily recommend reading the book. Uh, I listened to it on Audible and I loved it because you can take it in small pieces. And he really clearly in that book, uh, it's been a New York bestseller two or three times now. He really in that book defines how this is happening and the mechanism that's working. But my more favorite book that I recommend people read is The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. Um, he's a biologist who started exploring in the world of kinesiology, like muscle testing kinesiology, and started realizing that there's more to the body and to the brain than we understood and started delving into the realm of quantum physics as well. And he is one of the, I believe he's one of the thought leaders of really what we're experiencing now in our culture of understanding how the unconscious mind and how, what we believe, what we do, what our life experiences are, how they form our life. So as we're looking for this harmony within, what we really are doing is we're exploring where has the unconscious mind created disharmony? Where are we creating a lack of harmony based upon what our unconscious mind has already patterned? So imagine now instead that we react physically and emotionally with calm and clarity and confidence and choice to, to events instead of with anger or fear or hesitation, right? Because how many of us would like to have confidence and joy? This is the whole purpose of our healing process. But we have to use and we have to apply the tools that shift the emotional and the memories that actually shift the brain at the neurological level. So this includes the work that I do with the timeline therapy, which we'll get into. It includes neuro-linguistic programming work, which we're gonna do a little bit of. It's really about changing the picture that the brain is accessing, as well as the emotional freedom techniques, as well as tapping. All three of those things will actually change the way that your brain perceives information and what memory it's accessing as you respond to stress in your life. That makes sense? Joy. When we're a child, we have a lot of access to our joy, to our possibilities. So how do we do that now? My spiritual master love saying just smile and it seems really ridiculously simple but here's the thing however you're holding your body however you're holding your frame dictates how you are going to emotionally respond and how your brain is going to respond because things are wired together. So there's that old adage, fake it till you make it. I don't necessarily always say fake it till you make it because people can fake it and suppress emotions or spiritually bypass emotions. So it's not about faking it like that doesn't exist or I'm gonna pretend like I never get angry or shove anger down, that's not healthy. But when you can't, what you can do is notice when you're sitting there working, how grumpy do you look and feel? And can you just bring a soft smile to your face? Bring breath down into your body. Sit up straight and gentle instead of being really hunched forward and tight. When we're hunched forward and tight, our body gets into protection because our, our solar plexus, our third chakra, which is about our self and about our self-worth. Oh, honey, here you go. Which is about our self and our self-worth. When we're hunched over all the time, that's also a protective mechanism. So if we're hunched and we're forward, our body thinks we need to protect. And it can start creating the physiological, the actual body response to that as if we need protection right now. So when we look at these pictures of children being joyful, or when we think about ourselves, how can we bring a soft smile to our face, even in places like when we're driving down the road, when we're sitting at our computer, 
when I do yoga, my instructor is always like, see if you can bring a smile to your face while you're doing that. See if you can breathe all the way down. Because if you can bring a smile to your face when you're in a difficult physical position, right? When you're all twisted up and trying to like, ah, my legs up here and I'm doing all these things. (laughs) And you can still have a smile on your face, even though you're uncomfortable. It teaches your brain that you can still bring joy to uncomfortable situations. It allows your body to soften and come into a parasympathetic, in other words, a relaxed state. So even something so simple as a smile, it doesn't have to be like, like really <laughs> obnoxious smile. You can literally just bring a soft smile. Allow your energy to calm. Allow a smile to come to your face. And this is why gratitude practices have become so popular. It's because when we think of something that we're grateful for in this moment, when we remember a time when we felt love and we felt joy, right? So think about it. Like if I sit here and think about a time that I was really happy or something that I thought was hilarious, Just like when I think about something that made me angry, it's going to change my body physiology. So if I sit here and think about, oh my gosh, that was so funny when my nephew did X, Y, Z, it's going to make me giggle, which is going to change my whole physiology. This is how simple it is to change our state in any moment. When we're procrastinating, one of the tools we can use is to think back to a time when we were really, really motivated. And I'll teach you another tool as well. But if we can even just remember like, oh, remember that time when I was super motivated and I was so excited to finish that project and it felt so good to get that project done. And you just really immerse yourself in that time. It will change your physiology state right now. Isn't that great? So Before I move on, what questions do you have? What have you learned? What do I need to know? The name of the second book is um, Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton. I'll type that in the chat. Biology of the what? Belief. Belief. Yep. And that book is also really interesting because he even talks about uh, research tests that they did where they took DNA out of um, cells or, yeah, it's really interesting and how they replicated, how they survived, how they adapted. Like they took people, I I don't want to quote it exactly because I don't remember the exact, but it was something along the lines of they took some of the DNA out of cells that are usually um, sensitive to milk and put them in an all milk environment and then watch the cell mutate itself or mutate a series of cells until it could survive in that environment. So it talks about how whatever we're around, we adapt to and our cellular structure actually changes around it, whether it's toxic or whether it's positive. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting, really interesting book. All right. So the other thing I want, to, so we'll move on then to the next thing, which is what you think is the problem usually is not. I like to say the problem is not actually the problem. What does this mean? So when we're in relationship, and I'll focus it around this because that's the goal of this class. We often think the problem is the communication's bad or my significant, my husband doesn't uh, empty the dishwasher when I ask him to, or he doesn't take out the garbage or my wife's always nagging at me or, you know, there's broken promises. People don't do what they say they're going to do. Um, I'm not, no one's taking the time for me. And we think this is the problem. And I'm not saying it's not a problem, but what's underneath that problem? So let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried to fix something then realize what you thought was the problem actually wasn't? Like we try to paint a painting when we're a kid and we want more yellow and then we want more red and then we want more blue. And so we're just adding these colors and we're painting and we're doing all the things and we're 
mixing it all up and then it turns brown, right? Or we um, start cooking and we think something needs more salt. Mm, then it wasn't more salt. Maybe it needs more oregano. We had more oregano. Maybe it needs more uh, sausage. We had more sausage and we just keep adding things and then it just, it gets worse. Now we have that. So the same thing happens in our relationships. And the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. So our brain deletes, distorts, and generalizes information. We call these the filters that we see our world through. We have about 2 million bits of information that come at us every second. 2 million. Our conscious mind can process 128. So what happens to the rest of it, right? Like that's a big difference. It deletes it, it distorts it, and it generalizes it. What does that mean? Well, it either doesn't see that it exists, it deletes it, it distorts it. And this is what happens with miscommunication often where we remember, we can swear our partner said one thing and they can swear they said another thing. Or what they say gets interpreted differently than their intention. So for example, my four-year-old, I don't have a four-year-old, but like a four-year-old comes up to me and says, I need X, Y, Z. And I say, not now, honey. I'm in the middle of cooking dinner. I'll take care of that later. Our brain can choose how to react to that in so many different ways. So sometimes a four-year-old just turn around and be like, okay, whatever, and wander back to the room. Or it can decide, that four-year-old can decide, oh, mom doesn't have time for me. Or I'm not important. Or what I was trying to show her doesn't matter. And that's all unconscious. That's the unconscious mind. And suddenly that is the message that we hear in our relationships, not only then at four, but then that's what we hear for the rest of our lives when our partner doesn't have time for us. So it's not that they don't have time for us. It's that our unconscious mind sees that as I'm not worthy. I'm not important. I'm not lovable. So the problem is not the problem. The core of the problem is what's happening over here. Can't even see that. I just realized in the recording. The problem is what's happening over here, right? The problem is what's happening with this four-year-old child who didn't get that attention in that moment from her mother. And for whatever reason, that particular day, it patterned in as I'm not enough or I'm not worthy or I'm not lovable. And when I talk to people about their relationship problems, heck, when I talk to people about their business problems, I say, well, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? And we start really getting down to the core. What does that mean about you? What's the problem with that? What does that mean about you? It drills down to those cores. It means I'm not good enough. It means nobody will love me. It means I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. It means nothing I do is valuable. And that's the unconscious mind's trigger for everything that we are doing in our life. Now, every human has those challenges, right? So I'm not going to say like, oh, once we clear this once, it's going to fix forever. No. And once we start shifting that, Right? We, make, we look at what is the picture that the brain is pulling up when we think I'm not worthy. We shift that picture of the brain over here and we change it to this really positive picture of a time that we are worthy. Now the unconscious mind starts going, oh, look, can I do this? Can I do this report? Oh, look, I'm worthy. Can I have this relationship? Oh, look, I'm worthy. And it shifts the way that the brain sees everything. And of course there's layers to this. But we often create ideas of the world now based upon situations, things that we've heard and experienced and resources that we had or didn't have when we were a child.
Yeah. A lot of people have tried to change habits before. Right? We try to change to work out. We try to change how we work out or eat or sleep. We try to stop procrastinating. We set ourselves a schedule that we're going to follow really strictly and we put all of our energy and our work into it. This is why it's so important instead to create, to change the core belief that created that deep level of belief. And now I want to make sure that I give all the moms watching this video and parents watching this video a bit of, or a lot of grace, right? What I don't want you to hear, what I don't want you to do is to delete, distort, and generalize that story. So you start thinking about how much you screwed up your kid or something like that. It's not like that. Because we all are doing the best we can at every single time. Okay. And it depends upon the resources that the person is experiencing at the moment anyway. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're 12 years old and you go in the kitchen and you know you're not supposed to be in the kitchen working with knives and you use a knife anyway. You go to cut up an apple and you cut yourself and you cut yourself like deep. Well, as a 12 year old, you probably know how to bandage it. You probably know how to use a cell phone to call somebody or to run to the neighbor's house. But there can be a lot of emotions tied up in that. You can't drive yourself to the hospital. Maybe you're not sure if you should call 911 or not. Maybe there's nobody around because you're 12. Um, maybe you're afraid that you're going to get yelled at, or maybe you actually do get yelled at for playing with knives in the kitchen. So there's resources, but there's also fear. There's also emotions that are getting patterned into that moment, which is different than if you cut yourself right now as an adult, right? You cut yourself right now as an adult, you're going to be annoyed at yourself, perhaps you're going to, but you've got all the resources. You know how to call an ambulance. You know how to drive yourself to a hospital, probably. You know how to go to a neighbor's house. You know how to bandage it. So we've got more resources than we do when we're 12. Now imagine we're four years old and we go in the kitchen. We don't even know there's a knife on the counter. We're looking for a cookie. We reach up on top of that counter. We pull a knife down on ourselves. Now all of a sudden there's pain, there's blood. We don't know what's happening. We're screaming for our parents or for whoever's around. Maybe they come, maybe they don't right away. And how that whole scene plays out can determine the rest of our lives around safety in the world. Because maybe the world feels unsafe because you've cut yourself with a knife and maybe mom's in the bathroom and she doesn't, she hears you screaming and like, okay, she hurries up, gets there as fast as she can and coddles you and does all the right things and takes care of it. But your brain gets to decide in that moment how unsafe you feel or how safe you feel. And if your mom was a type of mom or your dad was a type of dad or somebody, whoever showed up was the type of person that, that dealt with panic and fear by, by screaming or by yelling or by expressing in a not so positive way, quote unquote, instead of having the resources to calm themselves down, to calm you down. Right, that creates a whole different pattern in the brain. So this is what I mean by the core belief, but also the resources that we have. Whatever resources we have as far as support, like people that have been really severely traumatized, if they have a supportive adult around, often the trauma patterns in their body and in their mind a lot less than people that didn't have any support at all. Right? Because the unconscious mind is deciding all the time. Where is my safety in the world? How am I going to survive? What's the best way to get through? So how does that show up in relationships? That shows up in relationships with how quickly you, you expect your partner to respond to things or how you respond to your partner when there's a stressful situation. Because whatever you learned in those situations in childhood is how you are going to pattern naturally. That's not to say people don't overcome that because of course they do. You know, I know a lot of people who have been abused who will go out of their way to make sure they never abuse their children. But that energy of it, if it's not healed, can still be there where they're like, oh, I want to, I want to, but I'm not going to. Children can still feel that energy. Right? So there's still a pattern around the energy that can be healed. 
So are you ready to play with that? Okay. So let's most of it. So, you know, tapping, we're going to do a little bit of tapping right now around road rage, actually. But what I want you to do is I want you to write down a couple of things, like two to three things, times in your life when you were younger, not a trauma, but maybe something that someone teased you on the playground or your brother or your sister um, called you stupid or someone stole your favorite toy, something like that. So I want you to write down a really specific situation. It might have happened many, many, many times, but just write down one. So how old were you? Where were you? Make it really, really specific so your brain can focus. And then as you think of that time, what's the emotion that you feel right now when you think about it? And then where in your body do you feel it, if anywhere? I just lost my Zoom screen behind me. But write a few of those down. So one simple event or moment in time, the past, present, future, that you feel emotion when you think about it. What emotion you feel. Rate your emotion zero to 10, by the way. And that's it. Remember, we're doing the emotion that we have right now because we can't change how we felt in the past. We can only change how we feel right now. And where do you feel it in your body, if anywhere? And so for those of you watching a video, you can pause if you need more time. Otherwise, we're going to keep moving on. So what I want you to do is I want you to take that piece of paper and turn it upside down. Pretend like it doesn't even exist. And what we're going to do is we're going to do tapping around road rage. Okay. So you can just repeat after me, side of the hand. You can mute yourselves if you don't want to be heard on the video. That's great. So even though I'm feeling anger in my gut, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I accept how I feel about it. And then, by the way, I want you to be tapping on the road rage, right? Not on the stuff on your paper. Even though I'm feeling anger in my gut, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I'm open to letting this go. And even though I feel anger in my gut, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I deeply and completely accept myself. The top of the head, feeling anger in my gut. Good, between the eyes, feeling anger in my gut. Side of the eyes at the temples, feeling anger in my gut. Good, under the eyes, anger in my gut. Under the nose, anger in my gut. Under the mouth, anger in my gut. Under the collarbones, anger in my gut. And under the arms, anger in my gut. It was right underneath them. Stop and take a breath. So this is emotional freedom techniques. I'll put, for those of you that are watching on a video, I'll put a link on how to actually do emotional freedom techniques. And you can also connect with me and I'll send you the, um, the layout, the PDF version of how to do it. So it's written down. All right, side of the end. We're going to do it again. So now what we'd normally do is we'd reevaluate how we feel in our physical, mental, and emotional space. So thinking about that guy that cut me off in traffic yesterday, how do I feel now? And then we'd redo it. So even though I'm feeling frustrated in my chest, 
thinking about pers that person that cut me off in traffic yesterday because they could have caused an accident. I'm open to letting this go. And even though I feel frustration in my chest, thinking about the person that cut me off yesterday. It could have caused an accident. And I deeply and completely accept myself. And even though I feel frustration in my chest, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I deeply and completely accept how I feel. Good, top of the head, frustration in my chest. Good, between the eyes, frustration in my chest. Side of the eyes, frustration in my chest. Under the eyes, frustration in my chest. Under the nose, frustration in my chest. Under the mouth, frustration in my chest. Under the collarbones, frustration in my chest. And under the arms, frustration in my chest. Good. Take a breath. And really take a little bit of water. You'd reevaluate the situation again. So thinking about the situation, of course, we're not doing that. We're just doing the road rage today then how do you feel? And just notice as your body starts settling down. And we're going to do one more round real quick. So side of the hand again. Even though I'm feeling annoyed in my chest, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I deeply and completely accept myself. And even though I feel frustrated in my chest, annoyed, I said annoyed. <laughs> Thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday. I'm open to letting it go. And even though I feel annoyed in my chest, thinking about the person that cut me off in traffic yesterday, I deeply and completely accept myself. Good, top of the head, feeling annoyed. Between the eyes, feeling annoyed in my chest. Side of the eyes, feeling annoyed in my chest. Under the eyes, feeling annoyed in my chest. Under the nose, feeling annoyed in my chest. Under the mouth, feeling annoyed in my chest. Under the collarbones, feeling annoyed in my chest. And under the arms, feeling annoyed in my chest. Good, now take a breath. And I want you to flip that paper back over that you were working on before and just notice that some of those things have shifted. If you think about those things you wrote down earlier, that maybe the intensity is a little less. Perhaps the emotion has changed in those situations. Right? Perhaps it's not in your body in the same way anymore. And this is what I'm talking about when I say the body is putting things into boxes, right? That we perceive many things very similarly because your body has the same strategies. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So this is great to navigate day to day. So often when I teach tapping emotional freedom techniques, we teach the full process, but I want you to remember that right now in the moment, when you're feeling anything, all you have to do is just tap. So if someone cuts you off in traffic, you don't have to say anything because you're already experiencing it. So you get to just tap and breathe and be really present. And sometimes you'll notice as you're tapping and breathing and being present, right? You got your hand on the wheel, you're driving, you're just tapping, you're breathing, you're being present. And you can just tap one or two points. Like if you feel like it's dangerous to tap your face, you can literally just drive and tap your chest. That's all you have to do. And breathe. This calms down the nervous system. It brings us from fight flight into parasympathetic. 
When we are in fight flight, we are also reacting out of survival mechanism. Often we're reacting out of emotion as well, fear, anger, right? Something that makes our, that our unconscious mind is going, this does not feel safe. This does not feel like it's in my highest and best interest. And emotions are the ways, it's just a chemical dump in our body. Emotions are a chemical dump in our body that elicit this reaction. And when we're in that state of our brain, we cannot use logic. So when we're in high emotion survival state, we are not able to use logic, which is why post COVID so many people are struggling in their relationships because everything that happens is triggering their survival mechanism because being around people suddenly to the unconscious mind is unsafe. Having somebody disagree with us gets us outside of community, which is unsafe. We are, we're, we're kind of in this conundrum post-COVID where we were taught that to stay six feet away from everybody because being next to people was unsafe. Yet we also know in our unconscious mind that we need community to survive. And it's part of our survival mechanism as humans to bond, to connect, to have partnerships, to have community. And when we don't have those things, our brain feels like we are not as safe. So when you're working with your personal relationships, look at if you have a friend that keeps bothering you, triggering you, I'm going to use that word. I hate that word, but it's an easy word to use when there's a huge emotional response, when someone believes something different than you. Tap on that. What's underneath that for you? So the way that you do this is ask yourself. Okay, so let's say, um, let's say you hear something on the television and your significant other, you think it's great and your significant other doesn't right? Like there's a new policy coming out. And you're like, that's a great policy. And your significant other is like, that's a sucky policy. And you feel yourself get emotional around their response. You feel that reaction inside of yourself, anger, frustration, annoyance. How can they believe that? That's ridiculous. Tap on that, but also look, what does it mean about you? And write this down. What does it mean about you? What does it mean about me that they believe something different than I do? Or what does it mean about me or about our relationship that that person thinks that policy, I can't remember which was which, right? But that person thinks that policy is great and I don't or vice versa. We have different opinions. What does that mean about what I believed about them, but what does that mean about me? How does that impact me, my safety, my well being? So, for some people, they don't think they're very good at politics. So, if one person believes that they trust and love believes one thing and they believe another thing, they think their automatic drop down goes to, I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm talking about rather than just, I believe something different because I believe something different, right? Or how can they believe that because this is what's better for our family. So once again, our safety and survival gets brought up. Or we make assumptions. If they like that politician, they must, that must mean that they are that way as well, which means this about me or my relationship. So there's this underlying, when we are emotionally responsive to somebody else's belief system or what they believe. This is us. This is something that we have learned, something that we've experienced in childhood, a way we have been taught to believe, to not believe. So an example I love using for this, and this is the root of a lot of people's money issues as well is let's say your dad or father figure or brother or somebody came home often and was always complaining 
or maybe it was your neighbor always complaining about their boss and how their boss was in control. And the owners of the company, they're just greedy and manipulative and they don't care about the workers. And all those rich guys, they're so evil. They just sit there and do their thing and they don't care about anybody else. That can pattern in our head. That can pattern in our head so deeply that we actually self-sabotage every time we start making too much money, whatever too much means to our unconscious mind. We may think that's not that much money, but our unconscious mind is going, no, oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to be one of those rich bosses that's evil and, and hates people. Or you don't want to get that promotion actually, because then you'll be that CEO that your father or your mother or your neighbor or your significant other disapproved of. You don't want to be that. Or our significant other gets a job like that. And our unconscious mind go, all of a sudden has this shift where, uh-oh, now my significant other is in this position of power at their job. But what I learned when I was a child is that's unsafe and that means they're bad and they're wrong and they're evil. And what does that mean about me now that I'm married? What does that mean about them? And we actually can unconsciously start changing the way we're reacting to our significant other because our unconscious mind is driving that. So this is why I take people through when they're struggling in their relationships. This is why I take people through a course called when to end it and when to stay which I've renamed like four times, but it's basically, it's basically a class in which we explore. What did you learn in childhood about what relationships are supposed to look like, supposed to be, what are the roles, where are the danger points? We look at why we got in the relationship we did currently, what were we expecting, what's changed? And we really clear all the emotions, all the belief systems so we can come back and really make a logical decision because once the emotions are out of the way, we can really see clearly what's going on. We can either choose to rebuild the relationship and sometimes just doing the clearing emotional work around childhood changes the whole structure of yourself in the relationship anyway. Because it brings some calm and confidence and it brings these ahas of, oh yeah, they didn't actually mean that in that situation. Or people can overcome even betrayal and infidelity and see what are the things that we need in the relationship in order to rebond and repair and move forward. Or sometimes it's literally, we've outgrown each other in some way, but now we can leave with grace and dignity and with care instead of being angry and dragging our kids into it. So how do we do this? Well, we do it through tap the tapping. We also do it through the NLP, which we'll get into in just a moment. But before we move on, I just want to see, are there any questions? What have you learned? What do I need to know? Okay. So once you learn how to clear using emotional freedom techniques, it's really great to navigate it day to day, as I mentioned. But some of those memories are still there in your unconscious mind. So this is what I do with clients as well as I help them find the deep unconscious mind stuff so we can deal with it, work with it. And they can have more freedom, right? Because have you ever learned to do something new? Like maybe you learned an art or you learned a new language and then you forgot all about how to do it. Or you learned a process on your computer at work and you only do it once a year. And then the next year comes around. You're like, I don't even remember how to do that. That's what can happen with this. But also we can learn that we have a certain disease and we become that disease. We have a certain challenge. We become that challenge. 
right? We become the person with ADHD. We become the victim of cancer. We become the whatever label we're putting on ourselves. Because the challenge I see is that people become whatever they get labeled as, whatever they hear. Now we get to learn something different. We get to get healing. Whatever we choose to observe, it becomes reality. And this is really big in quantum physics. There was an experience they call the double slit experience, which I'm not going to go through. I'll put a link. Um, I'll put a link in the videos and such below for the replays. The double split experiment. Basically what it was is they took one slit and they threw a bunch of particles through it and it created a line on the wall. But then they threw like a wave, like a water through it and it created a pattern on the wall, a series of patterns. Okay. And they made two slits. Let's go. And then they threw particles through it, made two lines on the wall. I'm sorry, the wave pattern did something made two lines on the wall when there was two slits. And when they sent waves through, it made a series of lines on the wall. When they started throwing electrons, particles through this, it made certain patterns that changed when the electrons were being observed. In other words, when they were trying to figure out why the electrons were making the patterns they did through a camera, seeing what hole or what slit the electrons are going through, it actually changed the outcome of the experience experiment, which goes to show that whatever we see, we create in reality. And this is not the first time that's shown up in results in physics and in experiments. So I'm going to show this, the, your belief you have creates an attitude, creates a behavior, which creates a result, which reinforces the belief. So what does this mean? If my unconscious mind believes that a good relationship means that my significant other does everything I ask at all times, that's going to create the attitude with which I approach my significant other, which is going to create the behavior of how I ask for him or her to do things, what I expect, how long that should take once I make the request. Okay. But my behavior is going to drive a certain result, which is going to reinforce the belief. Right. And so if I pull that back from how the other person is acting, if I believe I have to nag, I'm just going to use if I have to nag my husband and whine at him in order to get something, that's going to create the attitude with which I go and tell him to do something, which is going to create me coming across as a whiny, naggy wife, which is going to create the result of me being a whiny, naggy wife. Right, which may not get, which may or may not get the re, get the result I'm looking for from my significant other, but that will reinforce the belief that oh, I asked something, I asked something to happen, it didn't happen, and that reinforced my belief that it's not going to happen on its own, and I have to go nag more in order for it to happen. Let me bring it back and make it a little more simplistic and take out the other person. If I believe that working out is hard, and it sucks. That creates the attitude when I try to force myself to go to the gym or it creates my attitude about working out, working out hard. I don't want to do it, do it. So it creates behavior of not working out or hating it when I do, which creates more of a result, right? Of this annoyance, this weight, this downtrodden, like, ugh, I either don't go to the gym and I avoid it. Or I try, but I've been avoiding it for so long. It hurts to like go work out, which reinforces the belief that working out sucks. What we do as humans, we try to change that behavior. And we talked about this a little bit. So I put all, I'm going to work out three days a week. Or I'm going to stop nagging my significant other. And we try to change our behavior. We put all of our energy and all of our effort into changing it. We create a routine around it. And we decide we're going to go do that which may create some different results, which may change the belief if we do it long enough. This is why they talk about doing changing your habits. You have to do it for four to six to eight weeks, depending upon wh who you're looking at. But the thing is, if we don't see enough result to change the belief, the second we start or stop um, putting all of our energy towards it, behavior doesn't change. Now, if we can change the belief instead, everything changes. 
But maybe we change the belief by finding a type of workout we like. Maybe we decide we love yoga. Maybe we decide we love hiking outside. Maybe we decide it's really fun when we're with a friend or playing soccer. And now we've changed that belief that, oh, well, this kind of working out is great, which changes our attitude of how we approach it, which changes our behavior of wanting to go, which changes the result that we get, which reinforces the belief. <clears throat> and so now all this becomes easier. So in relationships, what is our belief? What does that mean about us? When our significant other works too much or doesn't take out the garbage. It's not about taking out the garbage or not taking out the garbage. It's something completely different. What's underneath that for you? When your significant other doesn't take out the garbage, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that you have to do it all? And that creates an emotion in you? Does it mean that you have no support? Does it mean that you're unloved? What does it mean? Because it's not about the garbage. And whatever that core feeling is, is driving your attitude towards a relationship, which is driving your interaction and your behavior, which is also driving the way that you're interpreting what your partner is doing, not doing, what they're saying, and what they're not saying, which is creating a result in your head that's reinforcing the belief that you're not listened to, that you're not honored, that you're not loved. And now I'm not saying, just to be clear, I'm not saying every relationship is perfect. I'm not saying that your significant other is being amazing and respectful and all these things and you're making it up in your head. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is in a healthy relationship where we start losing connection, the first thing to do is look at what in us can be shifted or healed that may shift the whole relationship because, right? It's not just the relationship. There's us, there's the other person and there's the relationship. When we shift one of those three pegs, it shifts the other two as well. Right, we look at the love languages. If your love language is having acts of service and so your belief that the garbage can take out means that you're not loved because that's your love language, but yet your partner's love language is affirmation and touch, but you don't want to touch your partner and you're not going to give him any affirmations because he's not doing what you ask. And he's just saying, they're like, I just want to be appreciated and I just want to be touched. I just want to hug. And you're over there like, I don't even want to touch him because I'm so pissed off. He's not doing these things for me. Right? You're at total complete odds. Neither one of you is hearing the love that you have for each other. You're both feeling unloved because you're not getting what you need. And you think you're communicating, but you're not. So imagine instead you start appreciating your significant other for what they are doing around the house. You give them a, a literal or physical pat on the bat. You make an effort in the way that they can hear it and the way that they need to experience it and watch your whole relationship shift. Your words create your reality as well. This is why it's so important to watch our words. Because if you are talking all the time about what your partner is not doing, how they are not serving you, how mm, disconnected they are, how they don't listen, the more you say things out loud, the more you're creating the physical sensation, the more you're reinforcing the neurology in your brain, and the more it becomes real, just like when you smile. So what are you choosing in your relationship? Are you choosing to smile? Are you choosing to find a way to reconnect and show love? And I get, it's not a quick fix. If you and your partner have been feeling disconnected for a while, it's not like one day you can just be all smiling and be like, okay, I'm going to show you all the love that you need. And this is going to be great and amazing. And I'm super excited. And then you go and you're hoping for this 
for this change from your partner or you're hoping for some reciprocation and they're like, hmm, she's acting a little funny today, right? Or he's acting a little different. It may take a couple of months. And if you are continuing to do your own emotional healing work around it, you will find yourself coming from a place of more confidence and joy and happiness that will naturally start shifting the relationship. Or the idea that the relationship is come to a natural end might become more clear. And that's okay too. And then you get to make the choice of what you want to do about that. Is it great just as a live in friendship? Great. If that's what you want and that's what the other person wants, like there's no judgment either way. I'm just saying, but when you have clarity around it, it really takes away all the emotional baggage of what the other person should and shouldn't be doing and what that means about us. If we can really have confidence and clarity in the choices that we're making, all of life becomes easier. So we are training our unconscious mind at all times. I want you, this is neurolinguistic programming now as well. I want you to watch the words that you're saying out loud as well. I encourage people to take the word but out of their vocabulary, especially when you're talking to kids, because here's what happens. I love you, but you need to go put your clothes away. I love you, but you go, go to your room. You're acting like a brat or whatever. Hopefully you don't say, tell your kid they're acting like a brat. But it happens. I love you, but. The unconscious mind deletes everything that happens before the but. Thank you so much for doing the dishes, honey, but. But, oh, that actually took away all, all the, all the thanks that you just gave. So replace that word with and. I love you and I need you to go to your room. I love you and I need you to pick up the clothes. I appreciate you doing that and I still feel like I need a little more support around the house. And see how different that energy is. Okay. So now, we're gonna do a technique. I meant to do this at the beginning I skipped over it, so we're going to do it now. We're going to do a technique to actually change our state in the moment. So we did tapping, right? You can always use that. This is used a lot. Um, I use this a lot when there's a really stuck emotion, right? Or it's really a powerful emotion that you're feeling in the moment. So here's what we're going to do. First, I want you to identify something that you feel often. So maybe right now you're thinking about, because I've been talking about it, you're thinking about all the things your partner doesn't do for you, or maybe you're not in a relationship and maybe you're thinking about, um, how annoying online dating is, or that jerk that you went on the last date with and how all girls or all guys are just blah, 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 whatever that, whatever that belief system is. So I want you to think about that really clearly. What is that belief? What is that feeling? Like really feel it. Maybe you can use procrastination too. think about something you're really procrastinating on. We're going to have it. Okay. You're going to stand up and here's what we're going to do. I'll get back for now. So I want you to feel, where is that in your body? Where is it? Is it out in your, like when you picture that, when you picture that I'm going to use the word procrastination because it's easy right now. When you think about procrastinating on that thing you've been trying to do for so long, where is it? Like if you were to know, just put your hand there. Like maybe it's here. Maybe it's in your head. Maybe it's in your gut. Maybe it's way over here somewhere. It doesn't matter. Just put your hand there. Close your eyes. I want you to really, really picture it. And I want you to grab it, like grab it as if you're grabbing a baseball or you're grabbing a pile of goop or whatever. Just really picture it really clearly. 
feel the feeling, see what you see, hear what you hear, and just grab it. And I want you to pull it with all of your energy and effort, nice and slow, out of your system, out of your body, out of your energy field. And I want you to pass it to me. And I'm going to grab it. Keep giving it to me. Give it to me. And I'm going to grab it with you, all of you, even those of you that are watching it on video. Right. This is quantum physics. We can do it through space and time. So do it, do it. Give it up to me. We're going to all push it out to the sun together. So imagine seeing it go out to the sun. Keep your hands up. Breathe. Really push it out to the sun. Push it out to the sun. Watch it burn up. Just watch it burn up. Push it out. Watch it burn up. Watch it burn up now. Good. Shake that off. Take a couple of deep breaths. Now. Imagine your biggest superhero. Like maybe it's a superhero when you're a kid, like Wonder Woman or Batman. Maybe it's one of your mentors. Maybe it's your best friend who always supports you. Maybe this is the future version of yourself who is positive and powerful and has the amazing relationship that they want. Just pick one and really feel what that feels like. See what that would be like. Hear what they would say to you. How would they would support you? And I want you to take that, reach out to the sun, physically reach out, grab that person, grab that energy, that mentor, that superhero. And I want you with your energy and your breath, pull that back in, pull in that beauty, that support that love, that connection, that knowledge that that's all possible for you. And I want you to put it back where that old picture was. So put it back there, feel the feelings, like really amplify all the positivity, all the joy, all the support, all the knowledge that you are enough. You are beautiful. You are light. You are love. You are loving. You are lovable. Put it there. See what you see hear what you hear, feel what you feel. When that feels solid, lock it into place like Tupperware or like a padlock, whatever you want to do. Let it allow it to wash through your whole body. Every single cell, every single membrane, everything in between. Breathe in that truth. And when it's locked into place, open your eyes and sit back down. And notice what's changed when you think about that original situation. So for many people, they notice that it's less emotional or it's less intense. Or there's a peace around it. People often, when they do this from procrastination, they feel more motivated all of a sudden. They're like, I can do this. I can rock it. I can do whatever I want. So isn't this easy? This is all it takes. So change your words. We went through that. Change the picture in your head, right? Do the physical. This is an NLP technique to grab it, push it out, pull it back in. Do tapping. Change your words. Do this technique. Breathe into your body. Look for the safety. Look for what, what everything means about you and change that. All right. And now once your negative emotions, I call them negative, you know, because that's the term that everybody uses, but I just want to be really clear. All emotions are necessary. It's good that we feel anger. It's good that we feel fear. It's good that we feel rage. Sometimes this is an indication our boundaries are being pushed, or there's something that we need to work with. We get to let go of those emotions. Emotions are energy in motion. They're meant to move through us. We are not meant to hang on to them. When we hang on to them, they go into our body and they create physical discomfort, disease, and pathology. Okay. So once we clear those emotions, we shift our beliefs. We have the tools to continue on through these new pathways, through these new neurologies. So we've actually built new neurons today. Now you get to make the choice to follow those new neurons, to redirect your path. So great, you've cleared your idea that you're not enough. Good, go show yourself how you're enough. Start looking for that in your everyday life. 
Where are all the ways that you're doing things great? Smile on purpose. You will can change your whole life, your whole relationship that easy. Is there deeper work to be done? Of course. That's why I have the career I do, right? There's always layers. There's always depth to work with, intergenerational work and such. And it's one small shift, right? They say if you change 1%, even if you change 1% every year, you are making exponential growth for the rest of your life. So just allow this to start being your 1%. Find the joy, find the confidence, find the clarity. So join some of my other classes. For any of you that are my premium program members, you have access to every class that I do except for the board certification training courses. Um, they're all available for you. We've got tons on relationships coming up on passion, on intimacy, on overcoming the trail, on jealousy. So check all of that out. Uh, DM me if you have any questions. Email me. I'm always available. Text me if you've got that phone number. And before I go, I also want to just offer um, my gratitude for you listening and taking care of yourself in these ways. Because one of the things I do with my clients is I want to empower them to do a lot, some of the work themselves, right? I want to help them clear the really deep stuff, but I want them to be able to clear the day-to-day -day stuff because that's where our power comes from, is being able to trust ourselves, work with ourselves, and then get support when we need it, creating interdependence instead of fierce dependence. Fear, when we are fiercely independent and we're doing it all ourselves, we run out of resources, when we are interdependent and we all rely on each other, we all grow in really amazing ways. But any other questions? What did you learn? What do I need to know? Thank you. All right. Namaste. You are loved. You are loving. You are lovable. I like to say that. Too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.